Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our discussion panel today. We've got really uh, some fantastic people joining us to talk through uh, the academic panel for teaching game design. And we've got Joyce Dormans with us here as well today, the original creator of Machinations. Uh, if I could ask all the panelists to, if you want to come off, uh, turn your cameras on now and say hello. Uh, while they're doing that, before we get started, if I could ask all of you just to go into the little chat box and as default, you'll see here, it will say to all panelists, you could change that option and make your chat all panelists and attendees. That would be great. So we can keep the chat going as we go through. Then into the chat, if you could just drop where in the world you are and uh, which studio or university you're from today, that would be great just so we can have an idea of who we've got with us for today's session. At the end of today's session, as always, we'll be turning off the recording, inviting anybody that wants to come and chat to us about game design or any other subjects we've talked about today. It'd be great for you to do that. Uh, and as always, I'm going to be keeping a track of everything today in chat. And I'll, uh, if you pop any of your questions into the chat or into the q and I'll be pulling those up and asking the panelists as we go through. And one thing I thought we'd just kick off with is a quick poll just to understand from the audience, how much you're using machinations at the moment in your courses. So I've launched a poll. Are you using machinations to teach game design today? Uh, so yes, uh, no, but you're planning to. No, but you're thinking about it. And the fourth option, you're not part of an academic institute, but just wanted to see what was happening. Perfect. I'll give you a couple of seconds and then we'll kick off with some introductions. I'm going to end the poll in a couple of seconds. There we go. And here are the results. So lots of people just wanted to come along, come along and see what was happening today. Several people already using machinations and quite a few kind of thinking about it. Brilliant. So I'm going to start off with Joyce. Do you want to just introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm not sure how much introduction I do need, but uh, yeah, I'm yours, Dormans. Uh, and about 10, 11 years ago, I came up with this this weird thing of visualizing game mechanics, uh, game mechanics and uh, internal economies, and that turned out into machinations. And I guess that's the reason why we're here now. Um, uh, since then, since I uh, finished the PhD, I've, I've had some quite uh, uh, changes in my trajectory. I, first, I was on an academic track, but these days I'm more uh, in, in game design myself. So um, uh, I'm, I'm working at a studio called Ludomotion, which is basically my studio, and we're making uh, uh, cool games. Uh, one of them is going to launch real, 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 real soon now. I can't tell you exactly when, but <laughs> it's going to be real soon. Fantastic. Uh, Jonathan, are you there? Hi, do you want to introduce yourself? We can't hear you at the moment, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon if you are <laughs> elsewhere. Sorry for some technical difficulties here on my side but now everything is okay. So I'm John Barbara. I'm from St. Martin's Institute of Higher Education in Malta. We have a, a degree, degree program in games and um, I'm using machinations for my game balancing course. Fantastic, thank you. Thais, do you want to introduce yourself? And I must say a huge thank you for you getting up so early in the morning to do this call with us. Uh, I know it's crazy early for you over in Brazil. Hi, uh, no problem. Uh, it was a weird wake up, uh, waking up at this time. There is no sun yet, but yeah, <laughs> that's that's part of living in Brazil. So my name is Thais. I'm a game designer and game professor in uh, PUC, which is a university here in Curitiba in Brazil. And I teach the game design uh, course here. And uh, I use machinations as part of the both uh, game design discipline and uh, mechanics and level design discipline. Fantastic. Thank you very much for being here. And Ertrigal. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's the toughest <laughs> name, it just arrived. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arturo. I know it's really, really hard to pronounce. Um, I'm the professor at the Bahçeşehir University in Turkey, Digital Game Design Department. 
Uh, so I'm actually using a mechanization tool. Uh, we have a class called Innovative Game Mechanics class. So I'm completely uh, having a semester using your tool and teaching them uh, game design with a bird eyes view, let's say. <laughs> so thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for being here. It's great to have you all. Uh, so I thought what we do is we kick off uh, and just go to Joris to kind of understand kind of how did you come up with machinations and, and did you foresee it being used this widely in uh, universities to teach game design? Uh, now, obviously, I did not foresee that uh, when I started uh, this uh, this whole adventure uh, 10 years ago. Uh, but, uh, well, the, um, the origins of machinations basically came, comes out of my PhD research. So if we, if we take a trip back in time, uh, I was doing a PhD, I was uh, studying game design. And uh, if you understand my background, I'm, uh, I was teaching actually game, game design and game development at a uh, applied, uh, University of Applied Sciences in the computer science department. But my background is actually in humanities. Uh, uh, I, uh, I did my, my uh, master's degree is actually in art history and, and literature. Uh, and I have a very strong structuralist uh, upbringing. So uh, I don't know if you, any, any of you are familiar with semiotics, uh, a very structuralist way of looking at things. So for me, it was very natural to look at uh, uh, games as artifacts. And I, I was wondering, uh, can I take this apart? And, and how do they work? And, and because you know, if you compare a game to a, uh, um, a film or a, a piece of literature, it's got a lot more moving parts, quite literally, right? Because it's interactive, it's a machine, it's a, it's a thing. Um, and I was trying to uh, dissect it. I, I was trying to uh, come up with formalisms to uh, to uh, you know, to do what uh, basically structuralism did for uh, for the fields of uh, art and history, or not art history, but art and literature and, and film and everything. Um, so I was trying to really get to grips to what are these qualities in games uh, uh, that uh, are worth mentioning. And I, uh, at, one, at one point I uh, came across uh, the, the idea of eternal economy. I'm pretty sure I read that in uh, Ernest Adams' book, uh, Fundamentals of Game Design. Uh, I read about that and at the same time already he referenced also the idea of having feedback loops and, uh, and, and um, deal with that economy, right? So, uh, and that really clicked for me uh, because at the time I was uh, playing a board game called um, uh, Power Grid or uh, Funkenschlag in, in, uh, in, in German, uh, 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 which is still one of my favorite games, but it's a very delicate game. It's very well-balanced economy. Um, and uh, reading about the feedback loops, uh, I realized that, that you know, uh, understanding the feedback loops in that game really goes a long way into explaining how the dynamic of that game actually works and, and, and why it is uh, behaving the way it does. So I started out... Uh, trying to focus on the, on that structure and see if I can find ways of um, uh, of, of visualizing that, and and because I was actually at the time, as I, as I told you, I was teaching at a computer science department. Uh, I was consulting some uh, some of my colleagues there, so uh, and they uh, uh, so I started basically I started out with uh, with UML. Uh, so they see, can I use UML? Can I uh, appropriate that that formalism uh, to to visualize that structure? And uh, I don't know if you, this is my uh, uh, the, the thesis I have, and I sort of thought it's more fun to show it like this uh, instead of a screen share or anything. Uh, it's also low, uh, nicely no tech, uh, but here you can see here. I don't know how big I am for people's screen. This is actually uh, the UML diagram that I created uh, for uh, for Google uh, Slack for Power Grid. Uh, but I quickly realized uh, if you look at it, it's uh, it's got a lot of details, but it not, does not necessarily reveal the things that I wanted uh, wanted to be revealed. So I started uh, to um, abstract that. So I came up with uh, this this version, uh, which is basically it's if you if you look very carefully, it's in there. But I thought this is really you know all the details there are not as important as as this structure. So this this is the uh, this is the thing. If you can see this. Then you can understand the game. Uh, uh, so um, I started started out visualizing these things, and I, I deliberately you know, moved away from UML initially to um, uh, to get a very lightweight uh, notation, because you know, I found that I want to make these diagrams very quickly. I want to make them very high level, 
um, I want to be able to draw them on a steamed over window in my bathroom if I have an idea and when I'm in the shower, uh, uh, you know, it has to be high level and, and, and focused. Um, and I started experimenting with that and I um, ran into Stefan Burat. I don't know, he's, a, uh, he's a, a French game designer. Uh, I think he's French. He lives in Belgium, though. Um, and uh, because and he's in the you know he's he's in the, in, the, in a group of game designers like Ralph Koster and uh, the people that actually go to a, 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 a small unconvention called uh, Project Horseshoe. And he saw what I was doing, and he and he said, "Well, you know, this is very interesting." And so we talked, and he sort of um, at one point he said, "Well, you know, it's it's a lot of moving parts." Um, and would it be actually be possible to uh, make this into something that you can play, so that you can press play and you can you can see everything moving? Um, and I thought, wow, that's <laughs> that's a very good idea. So let's do that. Uh, and from one thing that led to another, and that turned into Machinations. And if you look at Machinations today, right? So uh, the Machinations.io, it's 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 grown way beyond that original thing. Uh, and, and, and one thing that's uh, that's um, uh, striking to me, right? So uh, the original plan was to, uh, to make a very high level language, but I started adding details already during the, during the, uh, during the, the, the PhD period. You know, I wanted to make it, I had to implement all these things. So I want to make it implementable. And then you have, you get a lot of details and it becomes much more solid, uh, uh, more formal, I would say, so that I get slapped on the on the wrist by uh, uh, by the computer science people if I say something like more formal because either something is formal or it's not. Um, but um, uh, uh, no, and if you look at these days, well, uh, it, it can actually handle much more details. So I originally intended it to be a very high level language, but I uh, immediately saw that a lot of people wanted to add more details and make much more elaborate uh, diagrams than I originally intended. Uh, and that's fine, right? So it's um, uh, uh, if people want to use it for that, uh, uh, yeah, sure, go ahead. It's, it's actually a testimony how how uh, expressive the language turned out to be. Uh, so I started out basically. If you, if you, you know, there's there's actually if you uh, really want to get into all these sort of formalisms, uh, you might actually say uh, if if you really boil down machinations to its, uh, its core, it's it's basically PetriNets with a few extensions. Um, uh, and, and then there's a lot of what they call syntactic sugar. Uh, that's how my uh, professor at the time uh, uh, called it all the, all the time. So uh, you can make things look nice and, and, and collapse things into so that it, uh, into, into, into a few nodes, right? So basically, if you want to uh, um, if you want to explain this, uh, use expl uh, uh, explain machinations, you can only need to use the the pools and the um, the connectors because a source ultimately is a pool with, with infinite resources and a, and a and a drain is ultimately a pool that has no outgoing connections uh, and from a source and a drain and a, and a, and a trigger you can actually already make a converter etc so you can build up everything but it's more convenient to uh, to, to show it at that level um so uh, that's how it came into being and i, I uh, at the time, I was also teaching a lot, a uh, lot more than I do uh, teach these days. And I'm running workshops where I met Jonathan. <laughs> I think he was one of, uh, on one of the first workshops that I actually uh, did at the time. Um, so, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And I, I really saw immediately that it, you know, it, it resonated with a lot of people, not with everybody. Um, but I saw, uh, you know, it clicked for a lot of people. And to me, but it's uh, that might be a sort of personal bias. You know, if you run it by students, students that get it immediately, they tend to be the, um, the students that are well suited for game design. And some students that struggle with it, and sometimes they they, um, uh, they, they, they the click comes later. But it's an important step for them as well. You know, it's uh, you know, but if you're already a system systems type thinker, then it uh, uh, then it uh, typically is much more apparent why. Uh, this is a good thing, or and, and what it does for ground, uh, and why that's useful. So, yeah, I guess uh, it's a long answer to a very simple question. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think we'll we'll certainly kind of circle back on some of those points and and in the discussion later on. I think sure. now, if we can turn to Jonathan, because you've been using machinations to teach your classes for a while now. And what what are the how how do you how do you integrate machinations and how how do you do it? Yeah, um, uh, so yeah, as you said, um, it was the last workshop at a digital conference that I attended, and what hit me off was this ability to abstract 
the understanding of games. So in the first year of our games program, we have a lot of game analysis going on. And then in our second year, we have uh, game modification and then game creation. So of course, one builds on top of the other. For game analysis, uh, as Jori said, it's, it's, there are those students that hit on immediately and those others that take a bit of time. And uh, those that are more in tune with systemic understanding of games understand it better. So in my first year, the way I approach is that we look at board games specifically, because we can better understand what is going on in these games. Uh, we take their operational rules. So we're looking at uh, the ideas from Zimmerman and Salen from the rules of playbook. We're looking at operational rules and then abstract constitutive rules. So the underlying mathematics, the underlying structure that is going on there. And then I move them to state diagrams. So that's, I think, a first step to help them start abstracting the notions that is going on in a game and uh, transfer that into game states and transitions, the actions that players or the game world undergoes that change from one state to the other. Uh, that's, that's the first year. That's the sort of uh, breaking the ice with the students. And the second year, uh, when we do game balancing, we, uh, as I said, we have two assignments, 30% and 40% uh, out of a 70%. Um, coursework grade. The third person assignment would be the understanding of a game and then modifying it. And that's where I start to push this idea of uh, abstracting a game into uh, state diagrams and then into uh, machinations. And of course, the um, added advantage, of course, is the interaction part of machinations. They would be studying programming, they would be studying game engines, but it would be too early for them to implement the games at that level to try out their, uh, these modifications, these ideas. They would implement them as board games. But of course, board games take a lot of effort to try out different combinations. So machinations comes in as a real savior because they can you know, tweak see it work, see it not work, <laughs> pick again, and, and improve upon that. That's in the, um, the modification part where, so first of all, we take a game and we implement it as a machination. So they have a framework that they can work with. And then for the modifications, they can then uh, see how ca they can introduce new things. Um, for example, I, uh, ident I make them identify feedback loops, right? And then I ask them, okay, how can we mitigate against that feedback loop? What can we introduce to keep that um, under control or a negative feedback loop? Um, in the creation part, then um, we start with a simpler setup, but uh, that is, again, part of the design process. And then they would actually develop that into, into a board game. Nice. That's fantastic. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Face kind of same question to you, like how are you using machinations in your in your courses? So it's a bit similar as what Jonathan is doing, but uh, I think it's a bit more focused on experimentation itself than on the technical part because uh, our course here is is kind of a mishmash actually because. Uh, it's a, a digital games uh, course, and uh, as so, uh, all students go through uh, art subjects, game design subjects, and programming subjects, and they can pick after the first year if they want to focus on art or programming. We still don't have a, a, a game design focused program, so the way I see it, I'm mostly uh, introductory to game design uh, or we, we can get like in the median part of game design, but not in the complex or the, the I, I'm not really tutoring them to, to become game designers by, uh, by myself. I believe if they want to follow this, we have to talk after class <laughs> and that's what I tell them. But uh, my, Machinations comes in in the game design discipline in which uh, I introduce them to the tool. Uh, we do one or two classes uh, just playing 
with uh, machinations and uh, what each element does. And uh, we built together a small prototype. And after that, I give them um, homework to, to create, to uh, recreate one of their favorite games in Machination, or at least one of the systems of their favorite game uh, in Machinations. And in the next class, uh, they bring this, this recreation of theirs and we all play together and give feedback one to another. Uh, I focus a lot on students giving feedback to, an, to other students so they can start to develop the, the critical skills they're going to need as developers, independently if they're going to be game designers or not. And finally, in the mechanics and level design discipline, that's when we, we get a little bit deeper in machinations and we use machinations to balance a bit, but uh, it's, it's still not a, a whole semester in machinations, it's more like a month. And we use especially machinations studying uh, managing and uh, administration games. Uh, I don't know exactly how to say that in English, but uh, basically games like uh, RTSs or games that are managers and sims. So they need to create uh, this one game like that in Machinations. And again, we play together and uh, we develop together and we discuss about uh, what works, what doesn't work, what can be improved and what uh, other elements they can add to, to their game. And uh, it's actually quite surprising the extent in which some of the students go into creating a game in machinations. Like most of the students do a basic game that works and uh, use most of the tools and uh, have an end state. And it's an interesting game for itself. But some students get really excited and do like enormous diagrams. And uh, some of them create the most uh, crazy uses for machinations. I had a, a student, I think it was last year, that he made a, a game that uh, a unit was your player. And you had to go through all the, the story of the game as this unit. And each unit was uh, a different uh, NPC. So for instance, there were units that were uh, the enemies. So you could, your unit couldn't go through the same line as the line in which the enemies were. Otherwise, you're going to lose the game. And it was like this big of a diagram, but it was actually a map because you're walking through all those spaces. And it's like, where did you got this from? It's amazing, congratulations. <laughs> I always love how they can surprise me in their uses of tools that for me is, oh, oh this tool is for that. And then they come and do something crazy that I had no idea it was possible. Yeah, the, 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 the craziest thing I got from Mechanism, because I see that as well, and I think that's actually a very strong point of Mechanism, that it's possible, right? But the, the craziest thing I got from, uh, from Mechanisms was a Christmas card uh, in Mechanisms. Somebody in the early community made a Christmas card with a, a diagram with, with all the, the things trickling down. It was an animated Christmas card in Mechanisms, which was, was a, when I saw that, I thought, okay, okay, this is out of my control, but it's fine. It's, uh... it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, and a true rule. Uh, I'll, I'll get it right by the end. I know it's fine. <laughs> so, how are you using machinations and, and like uh, what are the things you found work well? Okay, so like as I told you before, we have a class. Actually, the it's a journey. Let's start with the establishment of the digital game design department uh, at Bilig University at the beginning, and then move to uh, also the Bahçeşehir University. So we were just trying to make a program, right? How we can make a four years of undergrad program and what kind of classes we should have. Uh, so and we were just wondering, the first grades was okay. We were going to start with the board games and etc. the game culture and 
many different classes, but how we were going to reach to the unity part, how we were going to do that development part. So, and I was just looking all the literature, then I found out with the game mechanics, advanced game design book, <laughs> the moment that I was just turning the pages. The interesting thing was, so I was already, it's been like 12 years I'm working in the gaming magazine. So I'm a gamer too, uh, writing and editing and et cetera. So I was already influenced by the StarCraft in 1998 and then the StarCraft II, obviously, and then with the Magic the Gathering since 1997. So I would have been, I was would have thoughts in my mind that in somehow I should teach these two games to the students but and how like things are really complicated in both of those games they look so simple yet they are complicated um i read the main articles about richard garfields and then i checked for the, some papers for the uh, starcraft but no it's need much more information then i found out while i was turning the pages of that book <laughs> i found that really good examples of the starcraft then i say yes yes that's what i need i need this kind of information this is my approach this is i'm think i'm i'm in the same way with someone in somewhere in this world so it's starting like this so and then I decide, so I've been using this program since 2017, I guess, uh, because it was the first, second graders in that part. Um, many of my students use it. So I find out that with all those, again, the bird view is really, really interesting, right? Uh, it was really simple for students to understand what is the source, uh, what is the, where are the connections, what, which goes to where, and then obviously the gates, how does it work? It makes much more sense before they are getting much more complicated coding, right? They get, I mean, in somehow they understand as far as I see, uh, they perceive it faster than the coding because of the logic in the behind the game. Like, so how does it work? And then of course, like, as Jonathan also said, the feedback loops were really important too, like in the positive and the negative feedback loops. So some of my classes were going like this, tell me something about the negative feedback loop. And they were just trying to find out the negative feedback loop. So it works actually. It, it was a really, really, really nice approach. And of course the iterations too, like making a different iterations and to see them immediately and very, very fast responsibly, especially for the last, I mean, the last year you got many different updates as far as I know. So things are get changed a lot because in, in the past we were using desktop version too. So yeah, in the end, I don't know, it helps. <laughs> I don't know if you need much more detail, of course I can give you, but yeah, to see whole the, uh, the, the that diagrams, how does them, I mean, look, it's really nice to see them in a one page, right? This is really simple and it makes a lot of sense and very, we have really relatively um, less symbol. <laughs> uh, so with small amount of symbols, we can actually tell, uh, I can actually uh, tell my students how these games are work, what we need for balancing, how we can create the balance. See, this is if condition, this if works in like this. So it is really uh, makes things easier for me at least. And I'm, I know that my students are happy to have this class. So we are all the two, all my students, uh, if it is the time they will do small demonstrations about what we did actually. If no one, I, I know like some of the are, especially after your voting, now it works a lot, I guess, because <laughs> now some people going to see it and usually what kind of uh, things we can do. So yeah, basically that's what we are doing. Yeah, fantastic. So, uh, your student, one of your students, a couple of your students are here. Yeah, two of them. Uh, they can raise their hands, I guess. Yeah, uh, perfect. Izal and Gina. They have small, very small and short. Like they will take maximum five minutes of their work. One of them, what they did as a third grader, is a Levy. Uh, he was a third grader when he did this last year. So, uh, it was their final project actually. I hope you are going to like it. It was very small and fast. Hello, Izan. <laughs> Hello. Hi, how are you all doing? Very good. Welcome. We'd love to see what you've what you created. Uh, it's a small project uh, for our final. I'm also a third grader, uh, third year in Bachelor University, a student of Dr. Artul. But uh, yeah, it's it, it was a it was actually a, a cool project that actually made us understand how machinations work, uh, how it is useful, and how how the games are really based on resources and 
it's a big part of, of games, basically. Uh, balancing is easier with machinations, obviously. So, yeah, we'd like to show uh, in our project, if you don't mind. Certainly. Uh, so let me share my screen, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, and let me full screen it for you. All right, so this is actually, uh, we actually designed a medieval racer, uh, which we, under the design, we said that we're actually pulling a cartridge, a horde with, with obviously five horses. And then uh, we actually made a me mechanic, extra mechanic saying that you can't really use the nitro that much. If you use the nitro, you're probably gonna overtire one of the horses. And eventually, I mean, these are all resources, by the way, the time, the distance and all. So it was actually pretty suitable for machinations. And uh, yeah, so uh, actually, uh, I can show you the show you the game, but there, there are so many different scenarios where we can crash or we don't we don't crash. So on, on the obstacles, uh, obviously this is an endless race there, uh, and this uh, endless runner. So let me show you the show you the game. So actually, we actually we have a nitro which is intractable, and you can see we have a distance which is our main uh, main resource, and obviously we have time over there which is another resource. So we all need to calculate these all. And they all have end game uh, issues. So obviously we have a needed distance to, to check out the, to advance to the next level, which will give us some bonus time. We actually survived one second left, but uh, uh, yeah. So also we have an obstacle system, which is uh, calculated in difficulty. Obviously it gives us plus 2% each level. Uh, the difficulty, I actually didn't, didn't use an intro, so we might fail here. We actually did, we're out of time. So the, the game is out over here. So this was one of the scenarios and we actually didn't design the game. And so far up to, up to that point, we actually lost three horses. So which means we have uh, 20%, we have 20 nitro bar, which is actually this times uh, the horses, times 10 actually. So that was the real thing. The player, the, the player couldn't actually, uh, can't hold down the nitro. So it's going to be more challenging. Obviously it's going to be too easy. And uh, the, the balance will be, uh, weird you know uh but uh with, with these now uh let's try it again let's try for a new scenario which i'll play it properly this time uh this is um this is me interacting with the nitro which is very cool to have interactable buttons and machinations so uh you can simulate the game we actually crashed and lost a horse right there so our nitro bar is maximum of 40 now uh you can't pass 40. we're actually going up to levels and we're actually cool on time now because i'm really playing the game uh and all, uh, we actually have a, have an exotic mechanics where if we have one horse left, uh, you can actually uh, leave the cartridge and then use the horse itself with all the boosts and uh, no penalties until you crash. You might crash though. Uh, so all, all these simulations, all these things are easy to see on machinations. And bear in mind that we never actually developed this game in an engine. So without doing those, all these things, we actually managed to balance the game. Uh, so yeah, we're on level five and we're actually ridiculously successful right now. I don't know why, but, uh, yeah, so, so there we have, we, we, we had one, we had one horse and our eventual current speed was 30 and we actually crashed again. Unlikely, so you didn't really see it, but at like in a scenario like this, let's see the way we are on level five, uh, we had level plus at what level five plus uh, 27 distance. So we crashed five times and we actually had plus 20, 20 seconds to, to, to play the game. So you can always see these things under machinations without playing the game, without even developing the game. And uh, that's those, these are actually the real uh, benefits of machinations. Uh, I hope the game was clear because it was actually at some, at some point, uh, it was not clear for us, but as we practiced uh, the tool machinations, it was, uh, it was getting easier and easier and uh, it was pretty cool to not open up Unity or Unreal and finish the game somehow. So yeah, it was really beneficial. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you so much you. for coming Thank on you. and sharing. Anybody have any questions? For anyone else on the panel have any questions about that? Uh, let me see the chat if there's any questions. If not, that's fine. Perfect. Uh, Gina, what have what have you been doing in in machination? Hello, how are you? Um, we've act. I'll share my screen as well, <laughs> uh, if that is okay. So uh, we've actually used machinations in research based articles. Uh, in, we tried to write an article where. 
um, we wanted to design mechanics that improve the feelings of belongings. But in order to do that, in order to demonstrate that, uh, we had to use machinations because it allowed us to demonstrate uh, the mechanics in article-based research. So it initially began with uh, Professor Ertrul teaching us the course in university, complex game mechanics. And uh, then eventually we joined the conference where we wrote that article. Uh, so this is the um, conference we joined. And our article even um, got published in a book which joined all of the uh, articles together. So uh, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, the article aimed on designing these mechanics. And since it's not very easy to implement mechanics, I mean, most of the time when you say mechanics, it's a abstract word and machinations helps us to make that abstract concept into an actual thing that you can visualize. Uh, so we did our article, we made surveys on what uh, certain things could improve feelings of belongings. It was more of a pro-social um, approach to mechanics. And after um, getting our results from the surveys, such as like receiving and giving help from and to the environment, that's a mechanic that would improve the sense of, of belonging, humor, playfulness, support. And after researching um, on articles that were already written, for instance, there are a lot of articles that talk how uh, MMORPG games provide models that foster senses of belonging. Uh, we ended up uh, actually demonstrating the mechanics we came up with uh, in the article with machinations. So this was one of them. Um, basically in this demonstration, um, you could cooperate with others, but when you cooperate with others, uh, you either have the risk of losing um, a friend, the cooperation could go bad, or you have um, the chance of gaining a friend. And then when you do gain a friend, your safety points start to increase because um, it's like you've gained a friend for life. And safety points here refer uh, to the feelings of belonging. And then you can get the win condition. So this is a very uh, small demonstration of how a mechanic can be implemented. And then there was another... Uh, mechanic over here. Um, basically, in this one, uh, in order for red to produce anything, it needs uh, blue. And in order for blue to produce anything, it needs red. And without either of them uh, helping each other out, without either of them trading their resources with each other, they can't produce anything. And that also um, increases senses of belongingness because I can't without you and you can't without me, even if I don't like you. Uh, it's more like a societal, political uh, approach to it. And then here, this is a very uh, simple demonstration of the prisoner's, uh, prisoner's dilemma, where uh, if both players cooperate, both of them gain. And if only one of them cooperates and then the other cheats, uh, only one of them actually gains. I mean, or they gain more than the other. But then at one point, um, that does not benefit them it, because with shared belongingness, you have uh, more gain. So yeah, that was our article. This is how we uh, demonstrated the mechanics and uh, that's about it. Uh, we came up with a few conclusions and limitations and that is uh, how the mechanics needed extensive ten testing but you can also do that with machinations through the graphs it had. Uh, so thank you. 
Fantastic. That's really, really impressive. Uh, it's, it's, it's always incredible to see how machinations can be uh, applied to all sorts of different things, uh, kind of outside of the normal kind of game loops. So it's uh, what I certainly got from that is seeing how immediately those concepts you were talking about, you can see them in the machinations model and how that's configured. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Any questions from anyone in the panel uh, to, our, to our students we have today? One quick question for me, like how, and I guess this is kind of out to everybody, but like when you, a lot of us have been talking today about getting getting over that um, students past that uh, initial hurdle of learning it. And some people just kind of get it immediately. Is there anything kind of tricks that you've developed or that you found that kind of help students get past that point? Jonathan, you're nodding your head. Yeah, um, I mentioned the state diagrams. I found those challenging in themselves, <laughs> but sort of the effort spent there would uh, lessen the effort then to understand machinations. Um, because having a static diagram is showing basic things, but then when there's interaction involved, it's closer to the real thing, um, but it's easier to understand once you have this decomposition of a game um, into these elements. I remember when I was doing my own masters and I was working on uh, the Doom board game, I had used machinations to design the Doom board game to help me understand what is going on. And then I had to modify it, modify it so I could modify um, on the machinations and then trying it out on the board game itself. So again, using it on board games, I think also helps understand what's going on because the uh, rules are handy and, and maybe simpler and more available than, than a digital game. Uh, but of course, there is the other line of thought that if we develop a game in terms of the user's perspective, the player's perspective, um, that is another way of how to go about it. Definitely. Faith, what do you think on that? Is there anything, any tricks you've got to kind of help students get over that initial learning curve? Um, I I notice at least with my students that uh, you can push them to do anything that they don't want to do. It's like you can you can take the cow to the water, but you can force her to drink. And my students are the cow because they're very cow like. But uh, what I do like to do is to give them challenges and give them time to experiment without consequences. You know, uh, that's not a graded paper. You don't have to deliver anything at first. And then with time, I start to develop, uh, to, develop to, to suggest consequences. Like now you have to do a, a, a paper. Now you have to do something that uh, it's uh, graded. And that's when I see the students that uh, really like the tool to really start to shine. But uh, it's not everybody who enjoys it. And that's OK, because uh, it's not for everybody, not every tool. It's for everybody. Fantastic. Doris. Uh, yeah, I, I think you no. Know, the, these two students they uh, very clearly illustrated one of the, the the things that I find find very important about the, the tool, and that's its versatility, right? So it's its ability to uh, stretch out to a very high abstract level, like we saw the design patterns that Gina uh, uh, presented, to a very you know, detailed and and uh, you can even go much further than Isel uh, the game show, but it's you know it's up and running in in, in the game, so it's uh, and and that allows. Um, Different comfort zones, so so uh, uh, can di have different levels of appeal to. Uh, uh, if, if you're more comfortable with a implementation, then the tool can can do that for you. But whereas if you're if you're more interested in in the abstract design and the high level, uh, uh, there's there's some some room for you to experiment with that too, and and especially in in in, in the, the latest stage because you know, um, if you're already uh, implemented minded or system minded and, and you. And you re immediately see the potential of making my game uh, uh, completely functional in in uh, machinations as Isel did, right? So it's 
uh, then I don't think you need much of a push anymore because uh, once you, you know, once you, you get into that, then yeah, for, you're, you're fine. You're, you're 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 in the rabbit hole, and, and you're probably not going to come out for a little while. Um, uh, however, you know, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, best workshops that I ever ran in Machinations uh, in the early days uh, uh, was a workshop on an, on an, uh, uh, for the Henrik de Koning Academy, uh, Academy here in Rotterdam in Holland, which is an art school. Uh, and they had a minor or some classes about game design, and I had two classes I did back to back. And the results were very good, even though those students were not very technical, uh, technically minded. But they, uh, and the thing that I did is I, I, I could be, was able to use it as a sort of brainstorming tool. So the, the, the workshop that I ran uh, was, had a very simple setup. Basically, I asked them to design a racing game, uh, not much unlike uh, Isel's. Uh, and I said, well, you have to, you know, uh, you think about uh, the progress that you're making or the distance that you're collecting as a, as a resource. Um, and I, I said, well, try, try to come up with some, some way to collect that resource. Uh, and diagram that, and then you probably say you don't you don't have anything there, right? So it's probably boring. It's probably a game of goose. Uh, you roll up, uh, roll something random, and then and you, and you collect resources. You go, and it's not enough fun. Um, and I said, okay, then you have these patterns, right? So you can have feedback loops, uh, and see if you add a feedback loop to it, what happens? Um, and once that, that it's there and it's going to spiral out of control, so what can we do about it? And then you know, what, what Jonathan mentioned, what sort of feedback loop can you use to counter it, uh, this? Uh, and then uh, and, the, and the next, uh, so that was basically the first workshop and that was already pretty effective. And, the, and then the, the second workshop, I said, here you have uh, these random patterns. So I, I put them on cards, right? So I like to do this brainstorming things uh, quite physical. So I had these cards with the, the, the design patterns uh, uh, that I at least identified. Um, and I just randomly gave out uh, these design patterns to the students. And I think, that, I'm not quite sure, Jonathan, I don't know if you remember that the, the, uh, the workshop that we did, the DGRA might have had a quite similar uh, setup. Um, and, and that allows them to brainstorm. So you have your racing game and now you're forced to uh, uh, use a particular pattern, right? So, um, and then you have to think about, okay, how do I implement this pattern and where do I implement it in, in a game? And that, and that really shows them the power. And uh, ultimately, uh, in those two days, so those two workshops that I did with those students, they all ha uh, uh, had a very poor start, right? So they, they had a very boring game where it's basically game of goose, and they ended up with something actually quite interesting uh, uh, and dynamics. And I think if you're able to pull the students through that process, um, and you don't have to go uh, into a lot of uh, technical implementations for that, but as soon as you, you manage to pull them uh, through that process, then, then you 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 conf you, uh, you have them convinced. Fantastic. Um, in a moment, I'm going to open up the the floor to to questions. So, if you're watching and you have a question that's in your mind, if you want to drop that into chat, I want to come back to you, Ert Ertrel. Uh I'll try and get it right. Uh, and just kind of congratulations on you know fantastic uh, demonstrations from your students. You must be Thank very you. very proud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And congratulations on being on the being published. It's uh, an incredible achievement for you. Uh, what what's your kind of top tips to help students get over this kind of initial uh, uh, learning curve? Yeah, I first of all thank you by the way, and I totally agree. Like sometimes, if I mean, if they did not want to join in that conversation, you know, they won't. <laughs> Whatever you do, uh, there is no way. So again, my example was in this sense was Magic the Gathering. At, at the same time, I was teaching them how to play Magic the Gathering. And then I was giving them some article to read, as I told you, like by Richard Garfield, and then teaching them the tool. And while we are learning the symbols and etc., they were improving themselves on the game too. But uh, actually I can, if I can link, I was then find out how to use in a more easy way the, the hypergeometrical calculations. Uh, I just link it. I, I, I hope it's proper. If not, you can <laughs> raise it. And the stat track was really helpful for my students to find a certain amount of numbers because this tool was really giving you interesting numbers to find out, especially when you were playing the Magic Tree Gathering. If your deck has a, out of 60 cards and if you draw a seven cards at the beginning of the game, and if you have the four card in the same name in the deck, so what are the possibility of drawing the, the card for one of the four cards in your next draw 
and if you are drawing uh, one card each turn. So these calculations, uh, with two, when they have the game in their hand and when they have the tool while they're learning the tool, and then when you have this other uh, Star Trek tool, a kind of a tool it is, um, when they combine with the numbers and the gaming together on the uh, mechanization, mechanization tool, it makes lots of sense because they were always afraid of the numbers, right? Uh, they do not know what to do. Like, what if plus one? Okay, why it's plus one now? What's going, how, how is it going to affect? No, now they have a kind of another side dish, let's say, uh, to improve their understanding. So it was my kind of solution to make uh, classes much more fun. And at the same time, learning a, one of the best card games <laughs> man created, I guess. Uh, so it was my uh, solution, let's say. It was my approach and methodology, obviously, since it's been like <laughs> four years, it might turn into a methodology of teaching in this course. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Please do, if you have any questions from the audience, we'd love to open up the floor to any questions that you have now. Just drop them into the chat or the, you know, the Q&A field. Uh, one question to kind of kick off the discussion is something we, we often discuss at Machinations, which is, is game design, is it an art or is it a science? Uh, I don't know who wants to take that one first. Uh, Joris? Well, um, I don't see much of a difference, right? So it's... Um... Uh, I think it, it can be both, right? And uh, but it's an interesting uh, field because one of the, the the most frequent comments that I got, especially early on with machinations, was, uh, or at least now, if you, if you are working with students that are very art inclined, they always fear that this is going to suck out the soul of the creativity or something of uh, of what you're doing, um, uh, because you no, know, you make something that they think is creative, fun. Uh, uh, and sort of inspirational, uh, vague out there. You make it very concrete, you make it very technical, and and, and, and they fear that it's get it's getting boring. Um, but as I as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, I, I've got this background in, in, in structuralism, and the whole idea of structuralism is that basically, you know, there is even in the most creative, in the most wonderful things, there is you no. Know, it's it's um, the quality of literature, the quality of uh, of art, is typically in in the craftsmanship that went into its making, right? And uh, to be able to replicate that in games, you need to have, at least you have tools. And uh, in order to have effective tools, you need to have science because that's where uh, you know, science or academia, you, how you want to call it. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important. So on the one hand, yes, uh, uh, machinations can be very formal and can be uh, uh, something of a, a straight jacket. You know, it, it can force you into uh, paths and things that you you not necessarily want to go and into but you have to understand this and you have to go through those motions also to be able to know when, when to break away from these things right so the uh, the best poetry for example is, is following all the guide uh, uh, all the rules of poetry and then breaks one or two uh, uh, and and that's the that, that's the thing that you uh, need to do so that's my take on it at, at least but um, not quite sure <laughs> people might disagree <laughs> Jonathan what are your thoughts, art or science? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think that uh, Machinations serves it well. Um, I find the science part more into the development, right? Um, our program is design and development. So it's like the art and the science that, that goes into games. And I find that the way Machinations allows a designer to visualize the algorithm, the, the, the mathematics, the framework that is um, underpinning the game that is being played. Its visual presentation is reaching out to the are more artistically inclined and, and helping them to formalize, yes, uh, their ideas into something which can then be developed. So this process from design to, uh, to development, so as I see it from art towards um, science, machinations is well posed to help in bridging that gap, if there is a gap. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Thais. What's your thoughts on uh, art, or, art or science for game design? Sorry, for some reason, my Zoom just disappeared and I could uh, turn on the, the microphone again. So the way I see game design for me, 
it's neither it's nor art or science it's more like a craft it's something that you need to do and understand and really really pay attention to the illy nilly little parts that uh, make part of it and understand how people use your game and understand what they feel in each part of the game and how the game uh, induces this feeling. And I think Magnations helps a lot because one, it helps you visualize uh, the flow of the things and how things are flowing without you have uh, without you having to to use a lot of man hour into creating that in the game. So you can make a prototype in machinations and test how the flow of things are. And then after you have uh, tweaked it and made it uh, work better, you can actually implement that in the game. And uh, it's amazing too to do you actually test things before you actually implement them? But uh, I also try to, to make my students see it as a tool of making games also, not only to test things. Because my personal view in, in games is that you can make a game in anything. I actually have a, a, a challenge that... Uh, that's what I call for my students uh, in the first weeks of class that they have to make a, a, a whole game in one uh, sheet of paper. So they have a A4 paper and they have to do to fit the whole game inside that paper, the rules, the pieces everything and uh now that we are in a pandemic uh this challenge was upgraded to the pdf challenge so you have the a4 uh size but you have to do a pdf that is just one page and then uh, i i give them sometimes generally someone asks if they can use front and back and that's like a shit because uh you you're actually using two sheets but uh, that, that's the challenge, you know, you have to, to create one game in one sheet of paper. And uh, I think if you start to, to look at, uh, you can make a game out of it, of all the things you have, you can do so much more games and so much more interesting games. That, that's, that's the whole potential I see in Machinations, you know. You can do a lot of things in Machinations, even whole games. Yeah, fantastic. Ertrell, uh, what's, what's your thoughts on art or science? <laughs> okay, um, it's a little bit complicated, I guess, right? I mean, I guess it's in which perspective we are looking at it, right? Um, I told you, even though we, ha I mean, we have a class now lately, we just created the games and philosophy class. In that class, this question, I guess you aren't even not allowed to ask because, you know, <laughs> things are really complicated. But um, I mean, it's a balance, right? Neither uh, science or nor like art. It's a balance. Um, actually, uh, when I was studying back then, like 10 years ago or something, I heard that uh, Sid Myers, you're already familiar with him, I guess. He said that uh, about the game, so I was explaining the game, series of meaningful choices. And this explanation really makes me think like, is, is it that simple? I mean, it's not that simple. Like, I mean, maybe if we are only playing the civilization game, yes, maybe, but things are not that easy, man. Like, I mean, it's not. So I've been trying to look in uh, more ideas about the game. So I found out many different uh, academics write many different explanations about it. And then I found out that the Jesse Shell's uh, explanation, the book was called The Art of Game Design. It was published in 2008. So. In that there is kind of a taxonomy. It was taking the game in the middle and it has the mechanics in the up and the aesthetics in the down below and story and the technology were side by side. So was, uh, the argument was actually the mechanics should be less visible and the aesthetics should be more visible. Uh, and the story and the technology should stay um, in the same diagram, let's say. So I mean, the question is actually also bringing me the idea of the 
kind of fighting about the ludology and the narratology at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, if you remember. They were always argued that without ludology, you can't exist. And the narratology says, without us, you cannot exist. Or oh, everything is the core mechanic. Without mechanic, oh, it's not calling a game. And the narratology says, like, we've been exist since ages. Like, you can't, you're supposed to tell something with your game. And, you know, they get, uh, there's a piece still, but... Um, oh, I mean, I just found out this ludology and narratology fighting during that, those period, and I just implemented with the idea of Jesse Charles, uh, this taxonomy about how the game is supposed to be in a way. So I found out, again, the balance and balance. So when we are talking about the balance, again, mechanization, it plays a really important role about this balancing step. So when, I'm, uh, when I found out, when I was learning uh, the tool, uh, I found out that I was also, also doing a really good thing about the balancing. So I found out what I need in my games or the development of the games, the balancing is an important tool, but the balancing is not refers only the mathematical balancing. This balancing actually supposed to be in the Jesse Charles argument, like yes, mechanics, yes, aesthetics, but the aesthetics is somehow more visible and the mechanics should be less visible, but it's supposed to be there and it's supposed to work uh, flawlessly so this makes the, that balance and with the technology and the story at the same time should stay all together so uh to your answer to your question my answer is a little bit complicated than this but it's balance i guess i'm sorry if i i don't know <laughs> if it's sufficient or not but that's my approach fantastic george you put your hand raised uh, I do, yeah, because I wanted to uh, respond a little bit to, uh, uh, and I'm going to try to say your name again as, as well, <laughs> Etugul uh, is, is, is saying, um, and I think balance indeed is, is key, but it's also you know, the, the, the thing that you foregrounded about dynamics. Um, uh, ultimately, I think, you know, um, uh, the, the dynamics are what make or break a game experience. Uh, and I say this partly because I'm, as I told you, I'm going to launch a game very, very soon and, um, and it's going to launch in early access. And... Um, uh, we're very focused on getting that, those dynamics right, and uh, it's 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 it can be very minor things, right, that that will affect that balance. Um, so uh, the game that uh, to, to to make the example very concrete, uh, the game that we're working on is a uh, is an adventure game, and uh, it's it's procedurally generated. So you have a world, uh, and one of the things, one of the tweaks that we had to do right now is to make sure that uh, the, the starting position, where do you start in the world and how far are things away from you? Uh, that has a very big impact on, on the experience, right? It's a very simple thing to change uh, because we, we're generating the world. So we can just uh, tweak some parameters saying, well, uh, the starting location is going to be just a little bit more in, uh, more central uh, and, and, and the place where you need to go is just going to be a little bit closer. But it makes a huge difference in the experience of, of how people think, Okay, I can actually achieve this thing, or I can uh, I can branch out in different ways, uh, and the dynamic, um, it's it's really that you need to understand. And in the final stages of development, the firmer that you you can grab that that mechanic, uh, sorry, that, that that dynamic, uh, uh, the better you're able to uh, to make those adjustments that you really really need. Um, and uh, in order to do so. You need to have a very firm understanding of of the of the mechanics that underlie it. So you need to know. Uh, which which dials to uh, which parameters to tweak, uh, or where to make interventions. Uh, if you uh, if you're witnessing particular behavior that you do not want to have or something that you want to make stronger, you have to understand. Okay, what is actually contributing uh, contributing to all uh, to this dynamic behavior, uh, and how can I take it away or uh, make it stronger? Um, and that's you know it's um, yeah, we, we, somehow we started with art and science, right? So it's <laughs> but that's. <laughs> But that's you know it's it, it takes a lot of uh, as the Germans say finger speed uh, you know it's very um, uh, it comes very tight at one point uh, uh, and it's it's uh, some 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 adjustments so one of the things that I uh, always notice with uh, with uh, uh, new designers uh, inexperienced designers is that if you if you're uh, you have the system and you don't not quite sure if, if it's if it's working right the adjustments that they make tend to be too small. Uh, it, it usually it's, it's very much more effective to make exaggerated uh, uh, choices. It's like tuning a guitar, right? So if you want to, uh, if you if you if you're going to increase the damage of a sword to find out whether or not it will, will make it uh, life easier for the player, um, and you just increment the damage by one, 
you might not feel it, but if you increment the damage by five, then at least you know whether or not you're in the, in, uh, headed, headed in the right direction, right? Uh, and you need to have uh, uh, this, this, uh, this grip on the thing. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's uh, so in the early stages, you, you typically want to um, make big adjustments so that you know what the effects of uh, every intervention is, uh, are, and then you can always tune it down. Back, right so but it's it's that i think ultimately it's that uh, the dynamic that you really want to want to get at that's where the game experience is perfect um i know that we're we're well over time so i just wanted to say a, a huge thank you to all the panelists we've had here there's uh somebody else i wanted to just say thank you to which is ali goth from uh norway uh he was due to be with us today unfortunately he had uh he had a, a loss in his family uh, so our thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family to wish him uh, well with everything he's got going on. So, but a huge thank you to all of you today for taking part in this panel. It's been really, really interesting. Um, so that everybody knows, or anybody that's from an academic institute, we're launching our new academic license. It's completely free uh, to apply for that. Uh, and it'll actually give you access to all of the features of machinations, including all the premium features, uh, in order to do that, at the end of this webinar, when you leave, it's going to take you directly to a form to input your details and apply for that license. Uh, and we'll get you that license uh, as quickly as we can. It'll be out in the next few weeks. Um, one of the requirements of that is just a link back to Machinations to say you're using Machinations in your, in your courses. Uh, so we can try and keep track of everybody that's using Machinations now in their courses. Our latest... Uh, look look at it said so there's about actually 360 universities and their academic institutes now using machinations so this content today has been really really valuable uh, and i'm sure a lot of people will be going away today and taking your words of advice and guidance uh, to apply to their own courses so a huge thank you to all of you i could never actually you, you asked me in the very beginning what did i expect when i was starting in the thing I would never have imagined 360 universities <laughs> doing this now within within 10 years. It's uh, you might you might think no, this is what I set out to do, but you're still a PhD student, so you're overly ambitious and uh, <laughs> and and usually you don't go anywhere. But this, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm really really proud and humbled by uh, by uh, by by the, all this work. Yeah, it's 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 quite incredible to see how. Uh, how quickly kind of people are just grabbing at the the platform and just being so. Like, you know, I, I had the pleasure of going out and showing people machinations for the first time a lot, and the number of people that are like, this is just an instant game changer for their their game design processes, and you, know, you can immediately see their brains. Right, I'm going to go off and do this now and uh, cut months out of their game production time in inside the industry, inside real game studios. So thank you very much, Joris, for all of your hard work as a PhD yeah, well, student that's got us here. Yeah, but I think uh, the, the Machinations team, they actually deserve a lot of those credit, right? Because I just made a flesh tool, you made it into a professional product. So that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, as you are, uh, our team would blow me away with the speed and the pace that we're iterating on the tool now, adding new features, uh, whacking down those bugs when they pop up. Uh, like it's for a, such a simple interface. The, the code that goes on in the background is immense and incredibly complicated. Often, you know, when you try and make something this simple, the stuff going on underneath is exceedingly complicated. Yeah, it can, oh, uh, the, the discussions that I had with my thesis advisor about those very small details. So how do you deal with randomness and how do you, uh, so there is, uh, there's, there's so many details that uh, even though uh, at, the, at the time it was still, Quite simple compared to what it does right now, but it's you know, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a whole lot of engineering that really does not necessarily fit my background. So I'm <laughs> I'm quite happy that uh, that other people are uh, are carrying that court, uh, torch for me now. <laughs> Fantastic! I don't know if, if anybody uh, has any other questions, please do drop them into chat. And yeah, we'll, we'll try and cover them off. But I know we're well over time. Oh, here comes a uh, a question in the chat. From your experience, what kind of uh, game or board game would lend itself for students' first step in machinations? I'm holding a workshop loosely based on Tracy Fullerton's Up the River modification exercise. While it's easy and fun to analyze and modify, 
realizing the game systems in machinations felt too difficult to start out. We've heard some examples from speakers uh, and races seem a good fit, but I'd still be up for some hints, especially ones that can be translated into the functional board game. Uh, actually, I also use Up the River sometimes, not always, but I, 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 I do use it sometimes because it's a, I think it's a, but it's it's more, uh, the I use it especially to, uh, uh, because it's so easy to break the game, right? So it's a very simple game. You can get it to play. Every, everybody, everybody has fun. It's deceptively simple and then say, not, not changes and then everybody breaks the game. So they always add cannons and more dice. I actually specifically ask them to make more strategic and they en end up making it more random. Uh, unless their uh, unless their experience with that, um, but actually using machinations, I think it it can help. But maybe it's even even simpler. The as I, as I uh, mentioned before, the, the workshop I, uh, that I typically do is you now if you're working on a design, just just model what you have. Uh, uh, first step is is just to make sure that you you get a model working for the for your game, and then then and try to make modifications and see how they can actually improve the game. That's uh, for me. That's always been. The turning point for the students. That's that's when they start really uh, seeing the value of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other any other top tips? Uh, if I may, um, also building on the original uh, impetus of Joris, which was the internal economy, right? So probably modeling some kind of economy from any game would be a good start to see how things interact. I mean, even Gina's examples um, of, of uh, game theory are also um, a good, good starting point to, to start with. Nice. Thanks, any, any other top tips? Any other examples you'd use? I personally prefer to to let the uh, the game choice be made by the students, so they can choose a game that they are particularly fond of or that they have a, a emotional investment in it. I think they tend to work better when it's a game that they like, they chose, because there is this personal relationship with the game. But I understand how that. It's complicated in a uh, short time of a workshop. I would probably try to find a game that most students have already played and have a positive uh, view of it and uh, pick one of those that they are more familiar with and they like. Fantastic. And that's all. Uh, yeah, actually, we are playing a lot of board games. We have a lot of board games. Uh, we are playing we pre-COVID time, especially. We had the nights where we are playing the board games. So nearly each week, we are playing different board games, starting from Catan to, to Carcassonne. And you know it, many famous and well-known board games. So, And then uh, we are actually, there are two approaches. One of them is a little bit complicated. It's deconstruction of the game. The, it took some time to do it, but it works as, as long as they like the game. The deconstructing it really works because they try to change the stuff, how you go backwards and backwards and how you can remake it in somehow. And the other one uh, is kind of the assignments they give, uh, changing the rules of the game. Uh, how many are up to them, like how many rules they would like to change and why, and to, I would try to see the effects of those rules. Sometimes they're changing only one rule, sometimes they're trying to change the game completely, it depends. As long as they like the game, uh, they work on it. So the deconstruction and change the rules are my approaches. Nice. Uh, Joris, I don't know, how much can you tell us about your, your, your game that's coming out this week? Oh, you already said something uh, that you shouldn't have said there. But uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, I, I read the question in the in the um, in the uh, in the, the, the chat, um, and uh, I definitely used machinations at, at several points. Uh, maybe not as elaborate as as as, as uh, some of the examples, have, but more as a as a high level brainstorming tool to to understand the economy of uh, of where, where we're going. Uh, interventions uh, just as brainstorming uh, right so uh, uh, and the game that we're making is a, it's a, it's an adventure game it's it's um, 
very, very typical in, in that sense, but we're actually making an RPG with no grind. So there's no gold and there is no experience points and there is no, um, so that's sort of taking out some of the resources that you would normally typically have in a, in a, in an adventure game, because I, uh, because you no, know, uh, maybe that, but maybe that's the best example that I can give, uh, because I want the game to be dynamic, but not in the sense that you have this very long slog of, of working your way through all the levels and, and and extending the gameplay in that way. But we're looking at this more uh, more the consequences. So we we deliberately make that made that whole economy a little bit more chunky. Uh, so uh, you know, instead of a very gradual uh, uh, pr uh, progress, you now there is there's we try to put in more bigger steps and uh, in, in in that way uh, so you know there's this uh, there's choices that you make and the choices they have consequences so there's there's bigger uh, turning points at least that's the that's the idea uh, and it's not um, not so much um, uh, about getting a, a plus one on a sword or a plus one on a skill or uh, killing every uh, any enemy that you you get uh, uh, for um, uh, for experience points, so um, and maybe that also goes back a little bit to um, uh, the previous day game that I made, the, the, the prequel to actually the game right now is unexplored. Uh, one of the things that I did there is actually experiment a little bit with game modes. So unexplored is a very typical dungeon crawl. Uh, you slog your way through the dungeon, uh, twenty levels down, um, and there is and it's filled with creatures. Uh, uh, but because everything is generated, you just this uh, it becomes very interesting to experiment with, right? So, so one uh, and I added the different game modes. Um, and one game mode was uh, called the ma uh, the magic mayhem and monsters mode, where I just said, well, there's going to be many more rewards. There's going to be monsters everywhere, and it's just going to be you know if if you if you really action based player, you can you can have a go at it. There's there's a lot of rewards. There's a lot of monsters, so it's uh, it's very arcadey. Uh, uh, but one that I personally found more interesting was the the uh, the, the desolate mode I called it, and what I did is just take away as many of the combats as I could possibly could, and also take away much of the healing. So it becomes very tense. So you're wandering through all these empty corridors, and sometimes there would be a fight, uh, and sometimes there would be a ward uh, with, with magic. But it's you no, know, it's a much tighter economy, and it creates a, a vastly different experience. Uh, uh, and and it, it had uh, a much more interesting pacing because you now the the magic mayhem thing it's it's all um, registers open constantly so it's 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 high pace uh, all the time whereas the desert mode was was slow paced and then you had these intention spikes which for me you know it, that that's more or less the the, the experience that I was I was going for and it has to do a lot with 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 those details in the economy and uh, and these things you know. Uh, uh, I didn't model them as, 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 as such, but I used the, the framework to work them out, right? So I, uh, I, 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 I'm a big fan of using machinations on paper and brainstorming on paper to see uh, uh, to see where I want to go, and that already gives me a lot enough insights. But yeah, I've been uh, living and sleeping with the machination for ten years, so uh, <laughs> that that might be something of an advantage. Yeah, definitely. This has been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate uh, you all taking the time. I know we're we're twenty minutes over time, so thanks everyone for for staying on. Um, any other questions from the audience? Please do drop them into the chat. Or if you want to come up and actually ask a question, you want to come off of mute. If you just raise your hand, we'll uh, promote you to a panelist. You can come and chat to us. But uh, just a massive thank you to the to the panel. For, for taking your time. Thanks, thank you for getting up so early in the morning uh, to come and join this session. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure hosting you today. Thank you. Any final words, any other words of wisdom anybody has? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you for the invite and uh, thank uh, thank all the panelists. It was great talking to you all and hearing your experiences. It gave me a lot of ideas to try on the next semester. Yeah, it's very nice meeting you all, and or sometimes a re-meeting because uh, I haven't seen Jonathan in, uh, in years. So it's uh, and it's, it's it's wonderful. And really, as I said, I'm proud and humbled by uh, by all of, all of your uh, uh, contributions to this uh, this uh, this thing that I once cooked up. <laughs> Brilliant. yeah according to facebook we last met six years ago so just yesterday <laughs>
so yeah thank you very much for this opportunity i'm very honored to be um, among others who have been able to take advantage of this and have shared the experience and i thank you all yeah, uh, thank you for this panel and the opportunity. It's really nice. I never expect to do something with this tool and this kind of event. It was really unexpected. Thank you for everything. And we are also waiting for you to our school. So you're all invited. So <laughs> uh, I hope we can see you in the future too. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I think we'll certainly do more of these types of sessions. Uh, I think they're incredibly valuable. And uh, I know we'll... A lot of people have got a lot of value from from your from your advice and guidance today. So I really appreciate it. Hi, Mihai. Hey, hi everyone. I just wanted to say I am super proud and super humble. This is a fantastic panel. Um, I honestly shed a couple of tears during during this. Just <laughs> sitting here and listening to you, some amazing things have been said, and it makes my heart grow. Um, and yeah can thank you enough keep being awesome brilliant and we'll end it there on those positive words thank you very much everybody enjoy and we'll look forward to seeing you in machinations bye-bye